Also, Tex, when you're finished with those in Valo, you might want to drive along Central. That is a nice sighting just to the east of uh, Giraffe Crossing. Okay guys, we're actually going to skip away from this area. We're going to go and follow up with Taxon in those lines. While we do, let's go. Taxon says they're running, so we're going to speed up. We're going to go and find out what's going on. In the meantime, we're going to send you back across to Brent. Welcome to an extremely cold Juma private game reserve. Uh, my name's Brent. I have Dangerous Day of the Dish on camera, and we're looking for Karula's Cubs. I haven't seen them yet, but it is quite cold. They could be sleeping in a little thicket. And I'm going to sit here for a little while. See if... Oh, that's not a good sign. I think Karula might have fetched them overnight. I can see little birds in the thicket I thought they might be sleeping in. Uh, I didn't find any tracks in the Mawati River as I drove through. So it's possible that they could have gone to the east or to the north. I'm going to check the boundary shortly for, for tracks. The ground's quite hard after that bit of rain. Oh, we can hear one of my favorite bird calls in the early morning. Oh, hang on, I'll show you other stuff. I'm just going to take my ears out quickly. Yeah, a rose or giant eagle are calling. Ooh, 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 ooh. I thought I heard an alarm call as well. I'm just trying to listen carefully. something moving on the opposite bank. Now the cubs might have moved around a little bit. They could be anywhere around us. And in this general area where she left them, if she hasn't collected them, okay, so I'm going to have to look for tracks. I'm going to have to be going quite carefully now. So while we do that, let's go see how Jamie's lion hunt is going. I'm driving fast to get to the lions and Herbert just goes, Jamie, we're going to die. <laughs> Which it does really feel like we are going to die. Oh my goodness, through the drip, through another dip, up we go. Whee! Everybody hold on. Sorry. Oh, I'm going to get shouted at by Tex and I'm going to drive here where he told me not to drive. Uh, Tex, I'm going to drive this portion of Vubu Road. Uh, it looks dry enough. Is that okay? Hey, those lions are running away from us. Okay, copy. Ah, 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 ah. My fingers are going to drop off. I'm a little bit worried about my passengers. Ooh. And the lions are running away. Don't run away, lions. Please don't run away, lions. They might be going back to fetch the cubs where they left them yesterday afternoon, which would be a very good thing because then we could find them there. <laughs> there is nothing like a lion hunt in the morning, or lion search in the morning, I should say. Oh, it makes the cold all worthwhile. That is, of course, provided that we actually find them. 
Please don't disappear into this horrible block lines. It is very difficult in here. Oof. Oh. Temperature drop. Copy. There's five of them, yay! All in Kormas together, hopefully with all eight cubs at some point. The, the, the attacks, I can only see five lionesses right now, but they might be going to fetch the cubs. I got to race! Oh! Everybody hold on, we're taking the corners at lightning speed. A little bit of a drift in the back wheels, in the mud. I've forgotten how to drive in mud, it's quite fun. It's been so long since we've seen it. Hey, there we go, there's Taxon. I can see him in front of us. Oh, please stop, Lions, please stop. <coughs> please don't go away. Oh, no, not in here. Not in here. What's going to be the best way? Oh, they're playing. I can see them. Okay, let's stick on the road for now. There is a slightly easier way in. I can see them off to our right. Tawny flashes of yellow. Let me just stop here in this gap. Hopefully they can, you can get a glimpse, the first glimpse of them. Uh, they're making life very tricky. Come on, lions. I see you. But can we get you on camera? You got him. Well done, Jandre. Okay, we cannot get the vehicle in here. <laughs> We're gonna have to go around. Hold on. There's a way in. Or at least the off-roading might warm me up. And I'm sure, just listening to the Game Drive channel as well, I'm sure Brad's going to be thrilled. He's got an extra set of hands in the form of Mike, helping him look for those cubs. Uh, the more eyes, the better. Okay, I'm going to go in here. Let's do it. I'm going to make a plan. Um, da -dum, da -dum. Stump, a huge stump that was nearly a broken. There's a big tree. Oh, I think we did it. You got them still straight ahead, Herbert? Yeah, oh, yes, there they are. Agreed, Shamsan. The lions are definitely moving with purpose. Here we go, we've caught up with them. Morning, ladies. I wonder if they're not either on their way back to some cubs or if they are on the hunt. Already that meal from the buffalo seems to have been digested and there's some hungry looking lionesses. Particularly Amber Eyes who always seems to be particularly hungry. Hello girls. Oh, so cold. I only see four right now spreading out in front of us. Taxon will keep us updated if there's any prey coming up in front of them. Oh, and here comes number five. All five Nkuhuma ladies back together once again. What's she seen? No. Just stopping to look ahead of her. 
our tax. Are you standing by there on Gallagher Shortcut? They're coming straight towards you. Okay. Let's go get back towards the road and stick with these ladies to see where they decide to go. I think, Shamsun, you're absolutely right. There is distinct purpose to their movements. That's an inconvenient termite mound. Oh, there's the road. While we catch up with these lionesses and get ourselves back on the road, let's find out how Brent's leopard cub search is going. So unfortunately the cubs aren't there, so now I'm checking for tracks to make sure they haven't crossed south over our southern boundary. So far, fingers crossed, no tracks yet. very carefully here. So while we continue our endeavours down in the deep south of Juma, uh, let's go back to the Nkahumas with Jamie. Oh, we've got a scene that we've become so used to with our Nkahuma ladies playing with each other as they race along, having a wonderful time, it's usually prompted by the young lioness She's often the one, the young lioness and amber eyes are often the ones that play with each other. And that's something so lovely to see with lions, to see that change in their personality, playful, not fiercely focused on hunting, but just having fun. They are taking us through a really, really difficult area, but we're going to be okay for now. We're going to stick with them for now. Oh, if they go into that drainage system, I'm on the wrong side of it. Eww. Um, I think we're going to have to go around the other side. Unless they decide to go flat. They're in a really tricky spot. There's a male calling. Is it towards Buffalo's or... to the east. Okay. It's, um, okay, we have to go around, I think. We're not going to be able to go through here. Watch out, Herbie. Uh, do you think they'll pop out there? Yeah. Herbert's suggesting that perhaps this might be worth going all the way around to Aubrey's Road in order to find them there. The one thing is this block is absolutely huge. try and catch up with them around here. And Morning Glory, thinking along the same lines that I am, which is five in Kuhuma lionesses, where are the cubs hiding on this beautiful morning? Oh, I think they've left them somewhere so that they can go out and hunt a little bit more efficiently, probably in separate places. Let's see. Thing. So they're still mobile west. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you think they're going to cross that scorver? Yes. 
Okay, that open patch on that side. Okay. Sorry, everybody. These lionesses are keeping us on our toes, which is good at this thing and at this sort of on this sort of morning, since it's nice and chilly. Okay, I think it's worth going round to Aubrey's Road and going round towards Voyatella Access. See if they don't pop out somewhere there. We'll go around because I know there's a there's a place where I used to go in, where we had them. There's a nice big open area there, and I think they might be heading straight in that direction. And there's definitely also a male calling from somewhere to the northeast of us. But I want to stay with the females. They, first of all, we know exactly where they are, and second of all, I don't know exactly where the male is. And I'm not 100% convinced that he is on Juma. He might be right next to a boundary. And so we find ourselves speeding around once again, but at least we're no longer in a drainage line system, which is definitely a relief. Morning, Impala. You didn't even see the, the lions that walked past you. Didn't even notice. All righty. Let's concentrate on relocating these lionesses. I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to go in over here or if I want to go around to the other road. I think I'm probably going to go around to the other road. The only problem will be if they spot something in the block that they want to hunt. Because there are some, as I said, there's some empty bellies there, so there are some hungry looking lionesses. And that even, even if they weren't hungry, a lion, just like every other animal out here, is an opportunist. If they spot something that they want to try and catch, they will give it a go. It just gives you an idea of how big this section of bush is that we're still racing along here. So while I decide where I'm going to go and search for them, I'm going to send you back across to Brent for an update on his leopard search. I couldn't find any tracks heading south, which is good news. So now I'm just checking the eastern boundary. Also, while we were looking for tracks, a male lion called somewhere in this area. I do feel it's a bit, a little bit to the east of us, but I'm, I was coming here anyway to look for the leopard tracks. So we'll keep our eye out for a roaring male lion. And if we get no luck here, I'm going to head back down towards the Mawati River system. But I'm going to come from further north and work our way down. I did not see in the little short distance of the Mawati we did this morning any tracks of her going uh, to the south or to the west. So if there is a possibility she might have crossed uh, across that main road. There's been a lot of vehicles on it already this morning. But hopefully, fingers crossed, she's got a kill somewhere on Juma. Uh, we might have to go back to that last position and really check for tracks a little later or in between drives. I would have said that male lion was around here somewhere, but I think a little bit further to the east. But he could be heading towards where those in Kahumas were calling this morning. This is also very good honey badger territory in the early morning. Morning, Remy. Uh, Remy says, fascinating how Kool is really good at raising cubs to adults. And do I think it's her knowledge, or is it because she's lucky? 
I would say it's probably a combination of both. Uh, and uh, what's that old saying I'm trying to remember now? It's, it's great to be good, but it's better to be lucky. So I think it's probably a, a combination of both. And she is an excellent mother. Uh, very, very alert, very observant. But again, it also just pays to be lucky as well. So I think she's got a combination of both. And to a degree, you always make your own luck as well. So uh, I'd say, yeah, a bit of both. So far, no sign of leopard or lion tracks, but we're going very slowly. Now, quite a bit slower than I would normally track. Now, the main reason for this is because of the rain we had. So a lot of people would assume that rain makes tracking easier, whereas all the tracks you're going to see are fresh. It's actually the opposite. What happens is rain compacts the soil, so it makes the soil very hard. And when you're looking for something as small as Karula and her cubs, uh, they have such light footsteps that it's really, really difficult to spot any tracks. It's not like an antelope that's got those hard hooves that dig in. So she'll often just pad and you can bear really see a mark on on the tracks on the road sorry so I'm gonna go as far as central down Cheetah Cut Line then I'm gonna come back down Drakensberg head down Batalia towards the Mawati River oh what have we here and just some kudu and impala tracks. Now, when I talk about how hard the tracks are to see, let me show you here. And this is what I mean about the rain compacting. Oh dear, this is quite a challenge now. Um, since it is so cold this morning, I have lots and lots of piles on top of me. Oh, well, I'm caught. Where's that caught on? There we go. And, oh, oh, double blanket and jacket over the legs. So now, if we have a look carefully, you can see the indentations. We'll see a sort of, of an impala running here. And you can see how they've broken the surface. Now, like a, a leopard or a lion, um, even when we've got shoes on, we do not have a hard sort of sharp point like a like a like an antelope does so let me give you an example so now this is from the rain you can see how the sand's been compacted and i probably weigh more than double what Karula does and i'm only spreading my weight on two legs not four and i bet you won't even be able to see a track as i walk past on the hard ground so let's go like this so if i'm walking slowly like a leopard does you see anything there Nothing. So that's what I'm talking about, how hard it is to track after the rain. And uh, that's why I literally I'm looking for literally half the time the tiniest little something like that. Just, just a little thing like that. There might be just one little bit of loose gravel where I can just slightly make out the shape of a leopard's track. And uh, quite a lot of it's you really got to be lucky enough to spend a lot of time tracking to see just that faintest little edge. Uh, that'll lead you to those cats. So after the rain, you'll notice we do generally, when we're tracking, drive a lot slower than we do when it's very dry and the tracks are much easier to find. Okay, let's continue our search. Now, Ali's wondering, do we monitor any of the animal's health or movements via a chip? Uh, we don't. Uh, the only animal that's monitored presently at the moment uh, out of the big cats is young Sindile, and he's got a, a collar on. Now, uh, those chips, there's probably not been enough research done on them. Also, their signal isn't very good. Uh, there has been some stuff saying it could negatively affect the animals in the long run with cancers and things like that. But also, these are wild animals and it's really, really 
uh, disruptive to put a chip into it because you've got to dart it, you've got to sedate it, and every time you dart a wild animal, there is always the chance it won't wake up. It might have a negative effect to the drugs, and you never know. So uh, we don't. Uh, some of the buffalo and elephants are monitored as part of a, a wider research program from Kruger, and obviously we're unfenced compared to Kruger. Oh, pretty little batters. Hope Dave. There we go. Beautiful little bird. You got him, Dave? Top of the tree right in front of us. Zoom. Zoom. Center frame. There you go. And that little chin pot spot batters. And the small little flycatcher species we get here. Very, very pretty little birds. Whoop, off he goes. So, I, I mean, it is possible, uh, and also a lot of that stuff's normally done in closed reserves. When I talk about a closed reserve, is that it's a fenced reserve, so there's a finite number of, uh, say, lions or, or things in there. But we're in a big open system. We're open to the Kruger. The animals migrate, move, get killed, uh, and, and from a health point of view, unless there is sort of a major injury that's been caused by humans, they've been hit by a car, they have a snare, um, we, 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 we let them uh, live out their life. So even though we might find a leopard that's wounded and sick and dying, we're not going to interfere, we, we're going to let nature take its course because we are in a natural system. And hello, kudus. Little bachelor group of kudus. Now, it's always good to know where the kudus are because they are great alarm systems for us. And they've got very, very good eyesight and very good hearing. And if they spot a predator like a lion or a leopard, they will bark from the tops of the trees. Not from the tops of the trees, but they will bark very loudly and that will let us know that there's a predator in the area. So knowing that there's a nice big bachelor group of kudu here, is good for our search. They're sort of uh, a lookout for us. Oh, look at him munching on his morning combretum or bush willow. So we've got some helpers in our search for Queen Karula. And we know if she pops up anywhere in this area, this nice big group of kudu bulls. Is gonna, they're gonna let us know by barking. So we're gonna keep on moving, knowing we've got some helpers on the eastern boundary. So we're gonna start heading back towards the west and maybe a little bit further to the north and then check the Mawati River system very carefully. Morning Yankees girl, on yesterday's sunrise safari we saw wild dogs, my favorite animal, and she's wondering where they relocated yesterday. They were, they killed an impala in, uh, in the property to the north of us. Uh, and I just heard now that someone is following their tracks also, unfortunately quite far north of our northern boundary. Uh, but with dogs, they might pop up anywhere. But I think with all the lion vocalization happening around uh, the Juma area, uh, they might not want to come too far down this way. Wild dogs are not fans of lions. Okay, so now we're going to head back towards the west and again checking very carefully for tracks. It is a, a beautiful, beautiful morning. You can see glorious light, no clouds in the sky. 
And remember, we're on a live African safari and you've heard me answer a few questions. So if you've stumbled upon us, uh, you can ask me a question. And you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live uh, or the email address questions at wildearth.tv. Okay, so... Whoa. Okay, so I'm just listening to the Game Drive radio and uh, some very exciting news and Yankee Girl was asking about wild dogs and I just got a report that they are heading towards our boundary almost exactly or very close to where Jamie is. So I'm going to give her a chance to speed off into that area. So you're going to sit with me for a little bit. Okay, so you're going to stick with me while we keep checking for Queen Karula. x Ranga would like to know if I've ever had to track a human uh, that was perhaps lost in the bush. I've had to track quite a lot of humans in the bush, but unfortunately they weren't lost. They were up to nefarious deeds. So yes, I have tracked humans quite a bit. Okay, let's have a look here. No sign of any tracks yet. But also, while we're looking, it's not only looking at the ground, we're checking and around us, we're looking in trees, and so far so good that we haven't had any of Karula's tracks crossing to the south or to the east. Okay. So I'm just listening listening to the game drive again. Okay, where could you be Queen Karula? Well, the nice thing about the bush is, while we're looking for leopards, we can see lots of other interesting creatures. Hey. And so far, no tracks. So I'm going to start slowly, as I said, heading down towards the Mawati River system. Then I'm going to drive the Mawati River system. If I still get no luck, then I'm going to go... jump off and go take a walk and see if I can find exactly what direction uh, Karula and the cubs went. Uh, hi Michael. Uh, Michael is wondering how big is Karula's territory? And do we have a map of it? Michael, it's about 2,000 hectares or so. And so uh, just under 5,000 acres. Um, and Michael, if you remind me on the sunset safari, I will bring a map along of it. Okay, ooh. Uh, as you remember, I said we're looking for that slightest little track.
quickly across to Jamie. Things have changed. Look what we've got. There's a Well, it sounds like Jamie's really close to the wild dogs. It isn't a potentially funny signal area, so hopefully they move out of it quite quickly. Oh, hello, Fluffy. How's that, Dave? Oh, there's another one in front of us. So I think it'll be a bit, bit more forgiving. So there's some water back up ahead, but I'm still looking for Queen Karula's footprints. There's a nice, actually big group of water back on both sides. I'm just trying to find one that's not obscured by bushes. And we should be getting some... Here we go. Okay, well, Jamie's got something far more exciting than water back, so let's go have a look. There they go, there they go. The wild dogs on the move. There is nothing more exciting than something like this. A sighting like this. Okay, they're going back towards the road, so we can too. It is really, really tricky in here. It's the worst possible place. Oh, as you can hear, to have a wild dog sighting, but we're going to try and keep up with them. Taxon's also back on the road, so he'll be able to help us. It's the three of them again, the same as yesterday morning. Everybody hold on. changing direction all the time as they always do and geez they are fast just to give you an idea I'm to give you an idea of just how fast they're going I'm sp speeding in third gear racing along and they're still ahead of us yeah they are they've stopped Okay, I'm going into the block. Tax says there's a... Hmm? Okay. Okay. There's apparently some Impala up ahead. Just hold on, we're going to have to move. There's Impala ahead of them. And there's a very good chance they're going to go for them. I think they're going to pop out towards the open area, which is exactly what we want. <laughs> There's three of us vehicles speeding along. Racing to get to the Impala that are just up ahead here. Because Taxon moved a bit further along and he saw them. There's nothing more exciting than a wild dog chase. They're incredibly fast, they're difficult to follow, but at the same time phenomenally exciting. Guys, I'm going to go around onto the road because that's exactly what's happening here. Hold on. Woo! <laughs> oh no! No, no! Wild dogs! Hi, guys! They're already going towards the boundary. Back to where they came from. We think this is part of the Sabi Sands Pack, which is denning off to the west of us.
We're just going to have to try and get them as they cross the boundary. Early morning wild dog chase. And we have Taxon to thank, even though we had those very brief views of them. We definitely have Taxon to thank for that. They are racing towards Triple M, and they're going to disappear into Simbambili. I'm just going to get hold of the guys in the west. Our morning stations, if anybody can copy me, there's three more Dutch making their way from Buertela Main Access west towards uh, Simbambili. No idea if anybody heard me. It's very relaxed looking in parlor off to our right. We can't stop for them. Everybody keep your eyes peeled for the briefest flash. There they are. straight ahead of us. My eyes are streaming, my nose is running. And there they are. There they are. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And even better, Abel is controlling the sighting for us on a boundary, which is always the nightmare. Phew! It just goes to show how incredible these animals are in terms of their speed and athleticism. Because they're not even tired. This is just a standard morning for them, jogging along. I have to move up in a moment, which I will do for Abel. We're going to race ahead. And these dogs are just eating up the ground. Sheer stamina. I'm racing in third gear. I'm trying to stop every now and again to give Jandre a view, but they're going so fast it's almost impossible. Oh, there they go, into Simbambili. No! No! Not that way. Oh, no, hold on. They're not in, they're not in Simbambili just yet. That's Parallel Road North. Bye. Thank you, Tex! Bye, guys! I think we are in... I'm having a moment of paralyzed doubt. Oh, well. Heat of the moment and all that. I'm pretty sure we're on Parallel Road North. On the boundary of Simba Bidi. Yeah, we are. Phew. Thank goodness. Okay. Going back to Triple M. Back to Triple M, I think. Sorry, Jandre. Awesome. Doing it. And Jandre does, our cameraman and Jandre do a fantastic job of. Keeping the camera on these animals, it is so, so tricky. But it's also what makes them as exciting as they are. Now there's a whole load of people now racing to the sighting as is bound to happen when they hit a boundary road because everybody can drive here, but I think they're going to pop back out onto it. Uh-oh! Holy moly! Bye! 
See? It's all of us. We all go completely bad. We're coming through here. I think it's worth standing by here. We cannot go crashing through that block. Everybody, I think we're going to pull out of the sighting. There's now about five vehicles on their way from every direction. There should only be three vehicles in every sighting. Um, so we're going to give it away, make space for them, because it's utter chaos in here right now. So we're going to pull out, and we're going to let everybody else have a turn with those wild dogs. It's also a very, very tricky patch. We'll try and rejoin them later. Hopefully they decide to go lie down somewhere on Arethusa. While I get onto the Game Drive channel and try and sort things out, let's head across to Brent and find out how he's doing. So we are still searching very slowly and very carefully for any sign of Queen Karula. Okay, so still no tracks. Okay, we're going to have to go through the bush willow arch, which means Dave's got to use his hands on cold steel as a form of torture. Now, one of the reasons I'm checking this river system so carefully is because even if, or even with the rain, I'm going to be able to see tracks here. Now, Eric's wondering how long will Karula's cub stay with her? Uh, well, Eric, it all, all, all depends. Males generally stay with their mothers longer, till about two years, sometimes even up to two and a half years. Females become independent normally just before two years, but sometimes as young as a year old. And it all just depends on the individual. And uh, what will happen is she'll start chasing them away. Now, with females, she will sequest a section of her territory to those, to that female, so the female has an easier start in life. Uh, with males, one of the reasons they stay with mom a little bit longer is they've got quite a lot tougher life. Oh, people are talking a lot this morning. Uh, and so they generally stay with mom longer. It's also the best chance for mom to spread her genetic material because the male will move out of her natal area and then mate with leopards that are unrelated to her. So it's the best way for the female to spread her genetics. Okay, so we've still got no sign of any of those leopard tracks. So I'm slowly making my way back to that area and I might take a little walk there to see if I can get a direction. As I said, the tracking is really difficult after the rain. But it is really beautiful driving down the Mawati riverbed uh, in the early morning. Slightly chilly because we are very low, but beautiful. Okay. Just checking all the soft sand for tracks. So far, just antelope track so far. Well, a huge safari live welcome to Ali. Now, Ali is a new viewer. Uh, welcome to the safari live family, Ali. And Ali would like to know how she got the title of Queen Karula. Well, Ali, she's our dominant female leopard, so she is the queen leopard in this area. Uh, she's also been watched by our uh, Safari Live fans for many years and she's successfully raised many, many cubs. And normally leopards have 
cubs have about a 70% mortality rate. But she's managed to, uh, I think, as far as we know, she's only lost two cubs over her entire, entire breeding life. So that's very, very, very unusual. Most times they do lose a lot more cubs than that in the first year. Or well, once they get, the leopards get to a year old, that mortality rate drops uh, down to about 20%. So we had that female leopard and cubs on yesterday's sunset safari, not far from here, uh, but on a really hard ground. So couldn't see which way she went from the vehicle. But I'm just going to slowly keep checking down there before I go for a little walk, see if I can find which direction she went. So it's always easier to see tracks on foot, uh, obviously a bit close to the ground, and even walking speed, you can slow down. And I'm in first gear and without touching the accelerator, this is about as slow as we can go. Now, Nora's wondering if we find Kruler's cubs on foot, does it still give you a heart racing effect? It definitely does, Nora. Uh, Kruler's quite nice on foot, she's not as snarly and growly as her daughter Shadow. Shadow definitely raises the heart rate a lot because she tends to growl and charge you when you find her on foot. Kruda just seems to look at you going, oh, you again. Okay, now this is a, a favorite crossing spot, so I'm going to go very, very slowly. All I've got is hyena tracks here. Oh dear. Now I've joined where my last, where I drove in this morning, you can see my fresh tracks coming in here and I've already checked this section but I'm just going to check carefully again now the cubs might have moved to the opposite bank they can do that it's not that far so they will stay in the general area where the mother leaves them but as they get older they start to get a little bit more adventurous a little bit more playful uh, so they can move around a little bit but now the sun's out so if they are still in this area I'm pretty sure they're going to be basking in the sun to try warm up. But I didn't see any tracks of them crossing. So, and I didn't find any tracks of her crossing the southern boundary, so she could be in this area here. She might have made a kill. Okay, this is where we spotted them for the first time on top of this bank yesterday. I don't see any sign of them here. I'm going to do a quick cruise pass, make sure we didn't miss any tracks when we were very cold in the early morning. I don't think we would have in this soft sand, but double check and then I'm going to turn around, come back and go for a walk. further down in these riverine thickets, so just checking very carefully. Time for plan B. Uh, 
Okay, as I said, I'm going to head back. Up the Mawati River. on the game drive radio for a second. Andrew, Andrew. Andrew, I had uh, Ngala audio probably 500 meters or so to the east of Mamba Junction and Torchwood in that area, uh, but earlier this morning. into these thickets again. Their camouflage is so good they might just be watching us. But my gut, which I trust when it comes to finding big cats, is telling me that Queen Karula has moved them. Okay, so I am going to go have a little stroll up in this river iron thicket, see if I can find, uh, hopefully, Karula and the Cubs, or at least what direction they went into. So while we do that, I think Jamie is going to go look for those lions again. So let's go see how that's going. That is absolutely my plan. It seems as though Brent read my mind in terms of whether or not I was going to head back to find those lions. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And we're going to keep listening to the game drive comms in case those wild dog decide to come back into our area. It got a little bit too chaotic there and as you may or may not have seen, we <laughs> nearly had a collision with another vehicle. Not quite, but almost. Right, the ladies were heading in this direction. Let's go and find them. And Michael, with absolute pleasure, because of course you would have seen me picking up the game drive comms, trying to talk, trying to drive, and trying to talk you through the sighting as well, which is always, wild dogs are always chaotic. It's exciting, gets the blood pounding, except now I'm frozen from the sort of come down from the adrenaline. But Michael, absolutely I will explain. So our game drive channel, is basically a method for us to a coordinate the search for an animal and b once we find the animal control the sighting so we only allow three vehicles in under the best circumstances if it's cubs or something similar then we change that we drop that down to one or two vehicles at a time obviously we want to try and get the best experience for everybody's guests so they can enjoy it we also want to not all search for the same thing in the same place it's be far better to spread out however we have different channels because we work in different parts of the Sabi sand. We have different channels that we use. So we have to cross from north to west or from north to east or vice versa, whatever it happens to be, to communicate with everybody around us. What happens when you get to a boundary line is as the animal is approaching the boundary, you call it in on the other channel so that everybody knows they're on their way so that when you get there, you can do a switch with everybody else and they can take over when they cross. Otherwise, what happens is the animal goes and it disappears off onto another property and then they can't find it even if they can traverse that area. So that was what was happening there, it's just coordinating who gets to go into the sighting. It's always a tricky business on a boundary line because it's being controlled by one channel and then you've got to switch it to the other channel and coordinate that smoothly. Now the game, that's essentially what the Game Drive channel is for. We don't speak in code, we just speak in um, Game Drive lingo but often you'll find that we just speak straight in English. It, we don't necessarily have to use the local names for the different things. Just waving goodbye to Mike who's driving towards the gate. So it is a... <laughs> it was a very... Oh, it, it's always a very 
not a complex process. You try and keep your words as concise and as simple as possible so that you don't fill up the Game Drive channel with needless chatter. Make sure that you are coordinating what's going on. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that needs to be explained about the Game Drive channel. You say where the animal is, if you find a sighting, where it is, what it's doing, and if it's walking, what direction it's in, and that you're going to stay with it. Uh, that's the sort of thing that we use the Game Drive comms through. For, for us, as presenters, both the final control and the Game Drive comms come through one earpiece. So we're listening, we're usually listening to at least <laughs> two conversations at once and maintaining our own. So sometimes we get that slack-jawed listening expression. We all do it. You just, you can't, you find suddenly you can't talk and listen at the same time and so you just become gormless and no longer able to, to function either way. And often you don't hear what's being said. There's a big tree in the road. Hello, tree. I don't remember seeing this tree. Did we see this tree? Oh, apparently we did see this tree. I just don't remember seeing it. We were in such a hurry to get to those lions, I guess. Interesting. You see what happens in one's mind. You get sort of confused when things are all chaotically happening at the same time. The Game Drive channel is an entirely essential tool. We have to use it and it does make our lives a great deal easier. So there's some relaxed animals in here. We've actually got a mixture of antelope. I'll try and position us so that we've got a clearer view. It's right into the sun, unfortunately. We've got a herd of impala, a nyala, and some waterbuck as well, all of which look very, very calm for animals that have been in the area where the lions are, which tells me Sorry, it's very difficult to position us properly. There's the waterbuck bottoms and an Inyala walking at the back. And Impala. Hmm. Very interesting. They don't look nervous at all. They don't look like they've just been hunted by lions. Now those lions, if they've encountered a herd of impala, they might hunt them. There's no, as I said, they're opportunists. It wouldn't really be a very good meal for five lionesses, especially with three of them supporting babies as well. But these, these guys would definitely have told us if the lions were in the area with their alarm calls, particularly the Nyala and impala. They start to give off very sharp and harsh alarm call barks, sort of a ba 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 sound from the impala is particularly they look very relaxed to me that doesn't mean there's not lions this is exactly where the lions should have popped out doesn't mean they're not hunting somewhere in here I just wonder whether they went flat in the block perhaps went to go and fetch cubs in the drainage system we don't know where they're keeping the other two sets of cubs Now we spoke about the fact that the lion cubs, oh the lions might have been going back to cubs in the drainage system and Francis, no, the mothers actually generally don't stash them all together. They tend to keep their cubs separate, particularly obviously when they're small because when they're small they're very vulnerable and they're not quite able to uh, sort of survive, not survive but be resilient to the attentions of their older cousins because lion cubs are very very playful but they can things can get a little bit rough and out of hand particularly when the mothers have to leave them so they're not there to monitor the situation as to what's going on with their little cubs so what they'll usually do is they'll keep them in separate places and then they'll all reunite at a kill site when they are old enough to start being bought that will change completely as they start to get over two, three months old, when they will be kept together, they will stay together, and they will form those bonds that will stay with them for the rest of their lives. So they definitely will start to keep them together, but not just yet. Our cubs, the, the, ages, the age difference at the moment is still too great. 
Obviously, that age difference will stay the same, but they, it will become less and less significant as they grow older. Go forward a little bit. Brent spoke this morning about how difficult it is to see tracks once it has rained. So especially, to, I very kindly, well, not very kindly, I offered to give Brent my hat because he couldn't find his cap. I now regret that decision rather wholeheartedly because I can't see anything. And it's definitely warmed up significantly. I'm loving the temperature at the moment. Oh, thank you, jean -Dre. Should we do, should we do two? Ca oh, that's very kind of jean -Dre. This is now going to be very interesting. Should we see how this goes? Let's try to do it. Yes? I, I feel like I'm a style icon right now. <laughs> <laughs> One massive hat. <laughs> Uh, it does definitely feel like one of those mornings that started out really cold and is going to get very warm very quickly. I'm feeling much better now. No longer like I'm about to die due to hypothermia. And I've got, thank you, John, right now I can actually see. I'm not sure how I look. I'm not sure it's a look I should go for. These lines, I don't think these lines have popped out here. And Anne, yep, that's exactly what it means. Uh, none of the lioness will stay. Sometimes they will. That, that's why we keep seeing them in twos or threes. Oh, I thought that, sorry, for a second I thought that ox pecker on that impala was an injury. Just out of the corner of my eye. Oh, goodness, right in the eyeball. Sorry, Anne, I will get back to answering that in a moment. That ox picker was sort of sitting on the side of his face and out of the corner of my eyes, straight into the sun, it looked as though he'd been injured. But he's absolutely fine, a healthy looking ram, lying down and ruminating. And the fact that he's lying down, even though sometimes prey species are quite comfortable with predators in their nearby vicinity, as long as they can see them and they're not displaying predatory behavior, the fact that he is lying down and ruminating immediately tells me that the lions haven't come within this area. There's no way he would feel comfortable enough to lie down. No alarm calls either. I think our lions have gone to lie down. Right, so Anne, yes, the cubs are left without babysitters, without a mother to take care of them. Sometimes they'll come and go without the rest of the pride. However, when they're all five of them are together like that, we can clearly see that they've left their cubs all alone in separate places. I really felt for those little cubs in winter. I feel for the little cubs in winter because I just imagine them all cuddled together in those cold drainage lines or those river systems where their mothers hide them. And I imagine how chilly they must feel. But of course, they're not, they're not like us. And they've also got a very nice warm coat to keep them warm. I'm checking carefully along the road here to look for their footprints coming out. I don't think they have come out though. I think they are still in there. And also is interesting, just by the way, we're on Aubrey's Road for those of you who are spotted hyena lovers, as I am. We're on Aubrey's Road, which is where they've had den sites in the past. There is not one single hyena track coming through here. So again, we're sort of maintaining that constant check of the hyena dens or the old hyena den sites. And I think because the lionesses have spent so much time in this area, the hyenas have just decided to move out. We saw them yesterday, or at least Brent and all of you watching on the back of the vehicle saw them yesterday at the kill site. So they're still around, they just are not necessarily denning here. And while we look for our lions, and of course 
We've also got Herbert on our team. Herbert is still walking in the middle of the block searching for them. And James Richard would like to know what the most unusual thing is that we have ever had to track. Oh, it's a very good one. Very good question. Um, what's the most unusual thing I've ever had to track? I found it quite entertaining and a learning experience. The, the few weeks where we had all of those very pregnant kudu cows part of the same herd. And I spent quite a long time trying to keep track of them each and every day. So that was an interesting experience. You don't often track antelope, although it's a very, very valuable learning experience in terms of trailing something. What else is unusual that I've had to track? I, honestly, James Richard, I don't think there's anything else that I would consider unusual. I've never had to track something like a honey badger or the, uh, tracking the, the, the traditional big five plus cheetah and hyena, we do do on a fairly regular basis. I wouldn't call it unusual. I might go ahead. Sorry, everybody, someone's looking for me on the Game Drive channel. Uh, Mike, I'm looping the block. I've checked Aubrey's Road. I don't see any sign of them coming out here. I'm looping back towards Gallagher Shortcut where we last had visual. And there we go. Mike just wanting to help coordinate his efforts to help us out in searching for these lions. I'm not sure that this hat situation is working out as I planned, but I can't fix it right now because my microphone lives in there. Lions. So I double check that they didn't change direction and come back out onto this road. I'm also giving more more thought to JR's question about whether or not what the weirdest thing is I've ever had to track. I, there's something I would love to do. I don't know if I would consider it weird, but I would love to go and track animals in other parts of the world. I'd love to see what it's like tracking a bear, for instance or maybe something like a jaguar or a tiger. Well, I think I'd actually be quite, I don't know, I think I'd be quite nervous of tracking those animals because I don't know them. I know that I can read animal behavior, but I don't know those animal species. Like I know our lions and our leopards and elephants and so on. And welcome to Lee Middleton, who'd like to know if we've ever tracked a poacher and if there is a problem with poaching in our reserve. Lee, we're really very fortunate in terms of where we work. Um, the Sabi Sand is probably one of the safest areas for wildlife in the country, if not the world. And I'll tell you why that is. It's because of the way that the tourism industry has been maintained here, the conservation, and that in turn brings in money for conservation. The more money you have, the better your anti-poaching will be. Um, have I ever tracked a poacher? Yes, I've worked in reserves with very, very serious poaching problems. I have tracked poachers before. I've backtracked poachers before. And I have been, we have actually done training exercises, or I've done training exercises in terms of tracking poachers and all of the tricks that they can use in order to not be tracked. It's a scary thing and it's not something that I'm, I'm not trained to be an anti-poacher professionally and it's not something that I enjoy doing. So I have worked in places where there is trouble with poaching. I'm very very happy and fortunate to work in an area now where we have incredibly professional anti-poaching methods. I'm not telling you what they are, obviously I can't. First of all, I don't know most of them, and second of all, it is, um, it is sensitive information. But we are very lucky here. And there's different approaches by different reserves. I've also caught uh, just putting up camera traps randomly. I've caught, anti -po I've caught poaching teams, sorry, poaching teams on camera before as well, which is really helpful because if you can get a good definition of that we didn't get their faces, but we certainly got their shoes, so then you can look at tracks and shoe prints, and we also got the type of rifle that they were carrying, which then will act as evidence if that rifle is ever confiscated in some, ma in some manner. A 
I'm sure. I think these lions have just gone flat somewhere in the drainage system. They probably didn't even go much further than when we left them. Come on, lions. I'd love to spend a little bit more time with you. I think the only way that we... What we can try and do is just poke our noses into where we went off-road for them before we lost them and just see if they're not somewhere in this region. I think they're hiding their cubs somewhere in this river system in here. In lots of sneaky hidey holes. And a very warm welcome to Kevin, who is a new viewer and would like to know when we are tracking, do we ever carry calls with us or do we imitate and what's the strangest animal call that we can do? Oh, Kevin, we definitely, when we're tracking, we actually don't use animal noises to attract the animals to us. The, it's, first of all, it's dangerous um, to do it in that kind of sense and second of all, in this particular context it's not ethical to do and what I mean by that is the fact that you could call you could call a male lion to you um, and get lots of different animals responding or male lions responding okay male lion is one thing let's say you play a buffalo distress call and a pride comes rushing in with their babies to investigate and then all of a sudden you've also brought in a male lion that then does damage to the cubs it is something that needs to be done very carefully and is a technique that's used by professional researchers rather than us when we're tracking. All we do is follow their footsteps. However, I do feel as though I do a pretty mean pearl-spotted owlet impression and those little owls, little owlets, you can call towards you. And that sort of goes along the lines of... So you can call birds to you, if you sort of get the idea there. And then, Jandra and I were talking about it, Jandra is about to get smacked by one of the worst trees possible, which is the zebra wood. Jandra says he's okay with that. He's a brave, brave man. I'm about to get smacked by the zebra wood and I'm not okay with that. Oh! Ah! <laughs> oh. Just have a look at these thorns. <laughs> this is not okay. Ch Chandra, I'm concerned about your safety. Ah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's quite all right. <laughs> You're right there, Chandra. Well done. Right, so now that we've officially managed to keep both eyes in our skulls, Back to Kevin's question. The best imitator of all of us is Brian, the cameraman. He can do some really incredible imitations. He's really, truly fantastic at it. I don't quite claim to have the same level of skill that he has. He's truly marvelous. And he's had hornbills, ground hornbills respond. He's had the black-bellied bustard respond. I can also do a monkey alarm call impression but that only that sort of only works about 50% of the time the other part of the time I sound a little bit like Donald Duck as does Jandre. Jandre and I fall into the same boat there the rest of the animals Brent does a good lion roar I don't Brent does a good buffalo distress call again I don't and I'm convinced that these lions are somewhere here where are you so this is where we last saw them. We're going off-road here. Got cysticulas calling in the distance. Oof, it's such a tricky spot. They're probably in this river system. Somewhere here. I wonder if they haven't gone to go lie down in the shade.
Of course. Maggie in Australia talking about tracking, and I do just want to go for a little bit of a stroll around here, just poke very carefully poke my nose up over some of the drainage line systems. But before I do, in answer to Maggie's question, Maggie's question is about tracking versus backtracking, and she wants to know what the distinction is. Tracking is when you, well, actually, tracking is looking at tracks. Trailing is following them. So there's a subtle, but we always use tracking in terms of finding the animals. So tracking them is following where the animal went. Backtracking is finding where they came from. It's tracking in reverse. So going backwards along where they came from. And that's useful in terms of narrowing down where den sites might be. If you've got lioness coming out of a patch regularly, if you backtrack her to where that is, you get a rough idea as to where she might be hiding cubs. Vice versa for leopards um, and hyenas and you don't really backtrack things like elephants or anything else, but backtracking can be useful just to build up a picture because that's what tracking's about. It's about finding the animals, but it's also about building a picture in your mind as to what has happened while you've been away from the bush or while you've been away from an area. So that's the distinction between tracking and backtracking. Speaking of tracking, I know that Brent has been wandering around on foot. Let us find out how his tracking or backtracking seems to have worked out for him. Well, it hasn't worked out well. Now, the ground's really hard, but I still didn't find anything going north. So, and I walked down a riverbed where I shouldn't miss tracks. So, when you rule out <laughs> one direction, uh, the remaining direction has to be true. But I'm just trying to double check here now that there's a bit better light. Oh, to see if she crossed, I'm causing a traffic jam. I'm going to check Ledwood Road next to see what Elvis says. Bonjour. Karula, Um We had Karula's Mampimpans here in the Shkova yesterday. But I can't find in Konzo going south. I can't find in Konzo going north. I can't find in Konzo going west. So I'm hoping in this block here somewhere. So I'm going to check Ledwood. Just okay. Let me just. So I haven't been on the Yandra radio for a while, so I'm going to get an update quickly. I've been off the vehicle for about 10, 15. I don't have any updates, please. I'm just going to really slowly again. Copy tax. I checked on foot uh, to the north. I checked that Shkova that runs between Ledwood and Mamba Road. I couldn't find any cons on the Shkova. I'm now checking Ledwood again uh, to see if maybe she's in this block between Gary Main and Ledwood. <coughs> Sometimes they like to lie out in the open for us. Other times, I've got to work quite hard. Now, not only are we looking for tracks, we're looking in the trees. Fingers crossed that she's made a kill. But while we are tracking, there's always interesting things to look at. So I'm always keeping my eye out for anything. As I showed you earlier, tracking at the moment is very difficult. But that's half the fun, it's the challenge. There we go. Oh dear. Now as I said, you're looking for the faintest little shape at the moment and I haven't been down this road yet but I know it's going to be quite hard to believe <laughs> but what I'm about to show you oh I'm stuck on things what I'm about to show you is in fact a leopard track and unfortunately it is going in the wrong direction 
and you see how hard the ground is here. So this looks like a cabin. It looks like it was playing or running after mom. You can just see the make out of the toes and then the back pad is there. So that's a bit bigger than that, but it's so difficult to see. Let's double check, see if there's a clearer track of maybe mom. Unfortunately, another vehicle has driven down here already this morning. But the tracks are heading out of our traverse area. So, let's go look for something else. Uh, hopefully she'll be back soon. We'll keep checking along this road. You never know, she might have, the, the little ones might have just been running around, causing havoc and playing. Oh, let me just get my seat sorted. Oh, here's my microphone. There we go. Hi, Brian. Uh, Brian's wondering how far do we get from base on our daily patrols. Well, Brian, it just depends on the day. Um, if we go down to the sort of southeastern corner of Cheetah Plains, we're probably 20 odd kilometers sometimes from base, but uh, that's on the roads, the driving, probably about 12 or 13 kilometers. And on average, I'd say we probably do five to six Ks, oh, maybe a bit, no, maybe more, as much as 10 Ks in a, in a morning but, or an evening, but it's, it all just depends on the day. Sometimes we barely ever move, and <laughs> if we've got a lion and leopard sighting, Probably do a K and a half to them and then we just sit tight. Nkonzo of Karula and Mampimpan cross south east into the block between Ledward and Gary Main. I'm going to do a loop Ledward Gary Main again. You can actually see my footprints on the road. Obviously, let's go that way. So I walked a big loop, probably about a kilometer around to check for tracks. And there's a little tributary of the Mawati that flows parallel to us. Yeah, and that's I was checking there because the sand's soft in the bottom and it makes tracks a little bit easier to see. But unfortunately, they didn't go that way. So they could be in this area here. But if she is heading south, it's quite possible that she is heading south towards uh, our edge of traverse. But I'm always the eternal optimist. I'm hoping we just spot her lounging in a tree with a, in a with a tree climbing impala. Now, of course, impala can't climb trees by themselves. They need some help from their leopards, from our leopards around here. It's a, a gorgeous, gorgeous morning. And notice there's a lack of impala and kudu and, and nyala in this area. So it could mean that those leopards are still around.
Hi, Brian. Brian's asking, is Shadow, that is seen on Safari Live and the Sabi Sands Game Reserve, uh, the same Shadow that's seen on the program Big Cat Diary? It is not. Um, I'm not sure if Shadow's a leopard or a cheetah on Big Cat Diary. I haven't watched much of it. Uh, but Big Cat Diary is in uh, the Maasai Mara in Kenya. So probably around 2,700 odd kilometers from us. Uh, if it's Shadow is a cat, they probably have a common ancestor a couple of million years ago. So maybe they're long lost cousins. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do one last roll of the dice, come around onto our southern boundary and then check it again very carefully and keep checking up in the trees and hope, as I said, to find a tree climbing antelope. Well, the one thing I did do on my little walk is I warmed up and lost a few layers. Might be slightly regretting removing a few layers that early. It is now back on the vehicle and on the move. A bit chilly. But while we keep scouring for any sign of seeing the ruler and her little prince. And Princess, let's go see how Jamie's lion endeavors are going. Hello and welcome to all the boys watching at St. Benedict's in Mrs. Emmett's class. It is wonderful to have you on board. Now I do hear that lots of you have not been on a game drive before in your lives, so I want you to put on your imagination. Imagine that you are sitting on the back of the vehicle with me on a safari seat and grab your hat or actually grab your gloves and your beanie because it's very chilly out here in the African bush this morning. And let me explain something about how this works. First of all, my name is Jamie and I have a man called Jandre who sits behind me. So instead of having guests, I have a man with a camera and he points it where we need to go, where we need to look. <laughs> <laughs> and what that happens then is some magic happens with technology that I don't really understand and it shoots up into the sky and then it shoots down into your classroom. That's pretty much my understanding. There's the internet involved somehow. They don't employ me to do their technology. However, what that means is that you, what you're seeing on your screen right now when I'm doing silly things with my hands is happening in real life here in the middle of the game reserve called Juma and Arethusa and Cheetah Plains. And we're right next to you and I think even if you haven't been on a game drive you've all heard of the famous Kruger National Park. Well we are right next door and the animals come in from the Kruger National Park to us or from us to the Kruger National Park because there's no fences there. So it means all of the animals are wild. It also means you can ask me questions about what it is you're seeing. Now uh, this morning we wait before we go anywhere this morning we are looking for lions because we saw them this morning but they disappeared somewhere where I couldn't follow them the first thing I want to show you because you're gonna to have to help me look for signs of these creatures first thing I'm gonna show you is what a lion track looks like now unfortunately or fortunately it has just rained here in the Sabi sand so the tracks are really really hard to spot what that means is I'm going to draw one for you I'm going to take out my earpiece. This is how I get questions through from you. I wear this in my ear and then I hear your questions. I'm going to jump out and I'm going to try and draw what a lion track looks like. But I'm not a very good artist, so it might go very wrong. So you're not allowed to laugh at me. Please don't laugh at me. I'm very sensitive. Okay, so if we look here in the sand, I'm going to draw you, make a nice clean drawing board. It's nice to draw in the sand. A lion track has a heel that looks like this. So this is the lion's footprint. That's a lion's track. See, that's the back of his foot here. 
and he's got three things at the back, three lobes, kind of like our heel print, but there's three of them. And then toes, one, two, three, four. Now, pff, there's a fly sitting on my nose, and now he's in my eye, but that's okay. We'll get rid of him in a moment. We'll get used to flies out here. So that is roughly what, okay, it's not the best lion track in the world, but that's what a lion track looks like, and it's about the size. So if I put my hand next to the lion track, this would be the size of a big male lion. A big male lion's track is about the size of my hand. Now this lion track would be going that way. So they point you in the right direction. Now we're really lucky. We've actually got a man called Herbert who is helping us out. He's on foot, can you believe it, looking for the lions. And he keeps telling me where to go. He says he is just to the north of us over here. So let's go and find Herbert and hopefully find some lions at the same time. I didn't need to find Herbert. There's Herbert. He's got a stick. <laughs> to help him look for the lions. Alrighty, let's go and help him, shall we? Now that I've got my earpiece in, I'll be able to hear your questions. Now, Zachary, we see lions and leopards pretty much on a... flies in my nose. Uh, we see lions and leopards pretty much on a daily basis. But you wanted to know what is the most unseen or the least often seen animal on our reserve. Zachary, that answer would have to be an animal called a pangolin. Our pangolins are really, really rare animals. They look like a walking pine cone, kind of. So they've got scales covering their body. It's a little animal. It's about this big. And it eats ants. And it's sort of kind of like an art fark, but not really. It's got these wonderful scales along its back. And I think perhaps Brent might have a picture at some point. So maybe he can show you what a picture of a pangolin looks like, depending on what else we find out here. Unfortunately, I don't have my box of books because it was raining yesterday and I forgot to put them back in the car. So a pangolin is probably the animal we see least. I see Herbert walking straight towards a road that's just here. And Jandre, we drove this road earlier. So it means the lions, we've just been missing the lions each and every time. Let's go and see. But you have to help me look, remember? So I taught you what a lion track looks like. You have to help me look for the evidence and you have to help me look for the lions because there's so... You've got lots of sets of eyes. I've only got two eyes. Jandre's only got two eyes. But with all of us looking together, We've got lots of eyes. Hello, a bit. So Herbert's just jogging to give us a little bit of an update. Let's hear what he has to say. He's helping us look, and he's a master tracker. He's really, really good at finding the animals. Herbert, you want to wave hello to all the kids? Hello. <laughs> good morning, good morning. <laughs> Going to check Impala? Yeah, I'm quite fresh tracks. Eh? Okay, awesome. Because I was just on Impala half an hour ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're on top of these. Did you drive past here? Uh, yes. Yeah, they're on top of them over. Yeah. Just check in here. I'll be doing jogging over and I'm going back. Okay, all right, yeah. so we go. Yeah, I'll quickly pick them over. Perfect, okay. We'll see you there. Okay, thank you. Enjoy. Thanks, Herbert. Herbert's a legend. Now, speaking of lions, we have a question about why it is that male lions fight over females. And the answer to that is that Cristiano, they fight over females. Actually, once they've established themselves in an area, lions, are, male lions are actually quite good at putting up with their brother, maybe having access to the females. But every animal out here has one particular aim in mind, or two. One is to survive. The other is to pass on their genetic material. In other words, to produce offspring. And that is why male lions, these are actually really beautiful tracks. This is not a lion track. This is a different type of track, and I want to see if you can guess what track this is. 
Let's see how on the ball you guys are today. Here's a beautiful track in the sand. This is a real one, not my drawing. And in order to help you guess, I'm going to jump out and show you what we're looking for, what clues we're looking for. I can tell you now that it is not a lion. It is something different. It's an animal that's got relatively big feet. Are these okay, Jean Andre? Perfect. Thank you. Instead of having those three bits at the back of its foot, it's got two. And these are its toes here. And these spots, you see these deep spots here? These are claws. So these are claw marks. And an animal walked along this road going this way. This is its back foot here. So here's the back toes and the claws here and the claws here. So what animal, and maybe I'll give you some clues because it's a bit of a difficult one. What animal has big feet, almost, almost as big as a lioness, with claws that stick out of it, that walks on its own, often, not always, but often walks on its own, and it's a famous animal. Let's see if you can guess what animal that might be. It is not a cat. That much I'll tell you. It's not one of the big cats because big cats have three lobes at the back, this animal only has two. I wonder if any of you are wide awake this morning in class. I know that Joburg's very cold at the moment, but hopefully the cold hasn't frozen your brains and you can work out what animal walked along this road. But it's not an animal we're looking for because we're looking for these lions. So Cristiano, lions fight for access to females because they want to be the ones that make babies. They want to be the ones that produce cubs. And that is what their life is geared towards, surviving and mating with a female so that they can father the next generation of lions. And Wade, yes, you've, been, you've got a little bit of background knowledge on lions. It is absolutely true that male lions can sleep 20 hours a day. That seems like a really lazy thing. But when they are active, then they're very, very active. Very, very good at moving about through the bush. So male lions got this reputation of being lazy and kind of a bit useless at hunting. But the truth is they can hunt. They can hunt very well for themselves. And they've got to be lazy because they get too hot. They're so big and they've got that big, thick mane, which acts kind of like my beanie and a scarf does, which when it's 40 degrees during the day, makes the lions really, really warm. The tracks are going to pop out just here. I know the path that they, these lions use because I know these lions. So that's why the lions spend so much time sleeping. And Aiden, you want to know why the lions hide away from people. The truth is, Aiden, out here, they actually don't really hide away from us. They're so used to, ever since they were little, little babies, and this group does have little babies with them. Ever since they were young, they've had people driving around in vehicles, so they've learnt that we are not a threat to them. But usually, if you are on foot during the day, only during the day though, it's important to remember that a lion at night knows that they have an advantage. But during the day, a lion is a really, actually an animal that's a little bit scared of people, because for thousands of years, people have hunted them. Now, they don't hunt them here, which is really good. We protect them here. We look after our animals here. But for thousands of years, these animals have learned that human beings will try and hunt them or chase them away from their cattle or whatever it might be. So that's why lions, they know that we are clever and they know that we can build weapons. So they've learned that we are scary, but only when we're on foot not when we are driving in a vehicle because they've only ever had people driving in a vehicle makes them actually feel fine they feel safe around us but at night a lion knows that we can't see in the dark as well as we as well as they can that's why it's really important to never ever go walking in the bush at night and to never sleep out in the open it's okay to sleep out in a tent but you must never sleep out in the open at night in the bush unless there's somebody watching all the time to make sure that animals are not coming to investigate. Because these are wild animals and we live in their home. Uh, 
this group I've said has got little cubs with them and Ike you wanted to know whether or not the animals the cubs could jump over their parents back no the little cubs at the age they are now they're only this big so at the moment they're not yet able to jump over their parents back they can't jump that high just yet in fact these little lion cubs that we have here are so tiny that they're even falling over themselves when they run around okay so we've got something interesting here well, we've got some animals called impalas and they're very very beautiful antelope but there's lots and lots of them and what that means is that they're very very important here because they're a food source for predators now usually impala are really alert if they think they see lions coming then they start to make a noise that goes ba 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 and that's their alarm call so they would let us know if the lions had come through here and it doesn't seem like they have so that means that between where Herbert had their tracks and where these impala are now there are lions hiding somewhere in the shade now look at these while you look at these impala you can see some of them have horns and some of them don't so it's the females that have horns oh, sorry the females don't have horns and the males do have horns and that's because the males need kind of like the male lion that we answered to Christoph's question it's the same thing with male impala they need those horns in order to fight each other so that they can fight over females so that they can win the best female and mate with her to make babies and you'll see if you look closely this is still a young male but if you look closely every now and again you might see a bird sitting on the impala I saw one on him but I think it might have flown away but there's birds fluttering all about around on these impala themselves they moved it away and it's gone on to look carefully look behind the, the the impala with the horns oh there with that female shook her head there we go on to the male impala again see how it's combing through his fur like that that is a bird called an oxpecker Okay, so this is a red billed oxpecker now can anybody guess what do you think he's doing do you think he's cleaning through the impala's fur hey so some of you may be thinking he's looking for food he's cleaning the impala and that's because ticks sit on the impala and the oxpecker will eat the ticks so it's a really really nice relationship see how it helps the impala because then it takes away the parasites that sit on the impala make him itchy and drink his blood and it also means that the bird gets food so it doesn't have to go flying around searching for any food it can just sit on the impala and comb into its fur and pick up the ticks that are there see how clever that is so the bird helps the impala and the impala helps the bird and that is called symbiosis and it's a mutually beneficial relationship because both of the animals get something out of that relationship that they're in okay we're gonna go searching for the lions let's see what else we can find and Geordie that will be an answer to your question this is these impala are one of the lions favorite meals but it depends how many lions you've got so if you've got lots of lions then an impala that only weighs about 40 kilograms isn't really going to be enough food for them so then that's when lions really like to hunt buffalo and when there's lots of lions they hunt buffalo especially if they've got a male lion with them because a male lion is much stronger and heavier than the female so they can help with hunting buffalo uh, probably a lion's favorite food is buffalo and very well done it seems as though some of you have got your thinking caps on you are absolutely right for those of you who said that that track that I asked you about earlier the footprint in the sand you those of you who said hyena you were absolutely right okay and the biggest giveaway is the claws in the sand because lions and leopards their claws live inside 
their paws. So live up in a sheath above their, above their paws and only come out when kind of like a cat. I don't know if any of you have pet cats at home, but like a cat, they keep their claws hidden away. Lions and leopards are like that. So well, well done to those of you who figured out that it was a hyena. Bravo. Right, I'm going to go look for lions for you in the meantime. Let's go across because it's not just me out here and I think Brent would really like to say good morning to you. Well, good morning to Mrs. Emmett's class at St. Benedict's. I uh, hope you guys are having a fantastic morning so far and welcome to the middle of the bush. And we're on Juma Private Game Reserve uh, next to the Kruger National Park. So there's no fence between us and Kruger. And I know Jamie's on the hunt for those lions. And we're on the hunt for some elephants, I think. We're going to see if we can find some elephants. But uh, remember, guys, ask as many questions as you would like about the bush, and we'll try to answer them to the best of our ability. Uh, my name is Brent, and I have a dangerous Dave, uh, who's my cameraman today. Of course, he's not really dangerous. It's just his nickname. Oh, there we go. Our first little animal. Oh, to the right. Yeah, little birdie. It's middle of the screen. A little bit to the right. Oh no, you got him, you got him, you got him, you got him. There's a little fork tailed drongo. Enjoying the morning sun. It's been a cold morning here. Uh, and he's part of oh, off he goes. And he's part of the flycatcher family. So he perches. Oh, off he goes, back to his perch. Oh, there's a fight going on. Oh, there we go. A Drongo war. Now, they'll fight over good spots to hunt or over girlfriends. When that little particular interaction looked like it was over good spots to hunt from. But it disappeared. There he is in the back of the bush there, but we're not going to stay with them too long. So they like to catch all sorts of bugs for their breakfast. Now, Nicolette is wondering... How was the big five chosen? So the big five is of course rhino, lion, elephant, buffalo and leopard. Now a long time ago when we didn't do photographic safaris which is what we're doing now, uh, there was big game hunting safaris and the big five is chosen from the five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. So when we're in the car they're not nearly as dangerous but that's where the big five comes from. The five most dangerous animals to hunt on foot. Now the wonderful thing about being in the bushes, you never know what's gonna be around the next corner. So there could be a leopard, there could be an elephant, there could be buffalo, there could be a lion. And one thing that happens is the animals are quite often on the move. So it's very dry at the moment. It's, and we're in a drought. Ooh, there's a very pretty bird. Boom, he's landed. Now it's called a lilac breasted roller. He also eats insects, but he can eat bigger insects and lizards. He's got a very powerful little beak. And he's going, not showing us his pretty side at the moment. Come on, turn around. And yeah, let's try to get a little bit closer. Oh, there we go, there we go, showing us his pretty pretty electric blue and lilac and green feathers. And again, you can see one of the reasons he's an insect eater is he perches out in the open and then he watches carefully for any movement of insects on the ground or in the air around him and then he'll take off and catch them. Very, very beautiful bird. See how very focused he is, checking around, looking for any hohos. Now, well, let's leave him hunting for, for bugs and we're going to keep hunting for elephants. Oh, 
Oh, unless he stays very still. Nah, he's gonna fly. Hi, Jordy. Jordy is wondering, is it true that elephants don't like the color red? It is not true. Um, I've oh, never, never, never noticed them having any particular preference in colors, but I've never noticed that uh, they don't like the color red. Hi, Yanni. Yanni is wondering how big are elephant babies when they're born? Now, let's think a very big human baby weighs about three kilograms, and a very big human mom probably weighs around 70 kilograms. So, a, a, a big elephant female can weigh 3,000 kilograms, so their baby is going to be very big. So an elephant baby at birth weighs, oh, depending on the baby, about 100 to 130 kilograms. So even heavier than me. And that's when they're born. Okay. Now, I'm looking for any tracks of elephants, and I haven't seen any this morning. So we had a, a bit of rain two nights ago. And what rain does with a lot of animals and in the dry season is it spreads them out. So animals like zebra, wildebeest, and elephant in particular, uh, where they've been concentrated around the water holes, have now spread out because there's little puddles of water that they can drink from all around the bush. So sometimes we've got to move a bit further to find the elephants and other animals. Just having a look, I thought I saw something through here. No. In black and right white rhino. Now the main difference is in oh what's happening here? Oh, my book doesn't look to me. Oh how did that happen? Um Sorry about that. I, I, well, I'll tell you. So a, a white rhino has got a... There we go. I can show you a picture now. A big square lip, and that's because it eats grass. So it's got a big, wide, flat mouth. And there we go. There we go. And a black rhino has a, a, a pointy lip, like a hook, and that's because they eat leaves. So he uses that hooked lip to grab the leaves and... There we go. Let's show you a picture. Much easier. So we'll start with the white rhino. Um, Dave, are you going to let me know about light? It's a bit difficult sometimes. There we go. There we go. That's not too bad. A white. There's lots of dust out here in the bush, so let's give it a bit clean. Okay. So now... If we look, you can see a big flat mouth, and they use their lips to pluck grass species out. That's the white rhino. And then if we go back and we look at the black rhino, we can see oh, there they've got that much more different shaped lip. Oh, sorry, that's there we go and they're able to grab leaves. Also, you look, a black rhino's head sits quite high up because he's got to eat leaves, where a white rhino's head sits very low to the ground so it can eat grass. Uh, also, the white rhino are much bigger than the black rhino, and they prefer different habitats. Okay, now, the next part of that question is, are they both endangered? Yes, they are both endangered. There's less than five, uh, I think it's, no, it's less than about 2,000 black, between two and 5,000 black rhino left in the wild, uh, and there's about 18,000 or 19,000 white rhino left in the wild, so not very many at all. We're lucky enough that the rhino population in our area is very, very healthy, 
and we've got incredible guys who do anti-poaching and protection of those incredible animals. Well, Sebastian, Matthew and Canelo are all thinking along the same principles and they'd like to know why do lions have manes? Well, it's a very simple answer. Oh, that's gonna... Is he gonna get away from us? I think he might. Hold on, hold on! Ooh, he's flying very fast. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. And he might escape. Dave might catch him as he comes out on the other side of the tree. There he is. Good camera work, Dave. There's a battalier eagle, a juvenile battalier. So it's part of the snake eagle family. So they've got very thick scales on their legs. And that helps them when they're trying to catch snakes so they don't get bitten and poisoned. That one is flying away from us quite fast. So well, good job, Dave, sticking with them. Oh, and there's a roller attacking him. Doesn't like eagles around him. So that pretty bird we just saw is attacking the bigger eagle, unfortunately behind the bush. But that, that happens quite often uh, with, with birds, that the small birds being fast, they can attack uh, the bigger birds. But back to the question about lions' manes. Why do lions have manes? Now, it is a lot to do with fighting. So when a male lion fights, the, the most vulnerable part of a male lion is around the throat area and the back of the neck. So that thick mane uh, helps to protect him when he's fighting with other lions. Well, Yanni asked a very difficult question. How many bones does a lion have? Now, Yanni, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you an exact answer, but I can do some educated guesswork. Um, let's say on average, they've probably got about 10. I mean, just work it out. So three times five, 15. Uh, 15 times four, 60. And that's just in their feet. Uh, 60. And then, oh, well, probably I'm guessing, and I am guessing here, probably around two, maybe between 150 and 200 individual bones uh, in their body. Now, you must remember some of their bones are very, very small, uh, like the bones in our fingers, uh, and some of the bones in their joints will also be very, very small. Hi, Keegan. Uh, Keegan would like to know whether elephants use mud for sunscreen, or is it true? Uh, they use it for lots of different reasons. Uh, sunscreen probably is not one of them. So what they do use mud for is to cool down. They'll spray mud onto themselves to cool down. Another reason they spray mud upon themselves is that little creatures, ooh, like ticks, get stuck on them. And if they roll in them or spray mud on them, those, those bad little things that hurt them, like ticks that suck their blood. Oh, no, don't fly away. <laughs> oh, there's a little woodpecker. And we we'll, might find it again. You got him there, Dave? Okay. And when the mud dries, those ticks get stuck inside the mud and they fall off. There we go. That's a little cardinal woodpecker pecking at the wood. Whoop! He's the smallest of our woodpecker species. Let me just go forward maybe, I think. Oh no, it's flown off. Uh, oh, he's come closer to us. That's nice of him. Got him there on the edge of the terminalia tree. Second tree. Okay, left. Zoom. Oh, there he is. There we go. That's a nice view of the little woodpecker. Oh, he doesn't want to be filmed today. Uh, he's off again. So those woodpecker. Oh, no, you found him. Sorry. There we go. Oh. Where'd he go now? 
Oh, he's top of the tree, I think. So those woodpeckers are incredible. So they've got a shock absorber in their skull that enables them to, there you go, center just behind that. Let me go forward a little bit. There he is. So they've got an incredible shock absorber in their, in their, at the edge of their beak. Oh, where's he gone? There he is, uh, popping up. And that enables them to, oh, up again. That. So that enables them to bore, <laughs> he's being very difficult today. It enables them to bore into the wood and remove uh, larvae of beetles and other creatures. Oh, it looks like he's got something. Ah, now that was actually really, really fascinating. Let me just see if I can find one of those for you. Now, those are very particular things he's feeding on that only really occur in a few type of tree species. And one of them is the silver cluster leaf or terminalia, which is here. Oh yeah, let me find this for you. This is really, really cool. So, I'm gonna show you what I'm looking at. So that little woodpecker is only looking for a certain thing. So it's flying from terminalia to terminalia, which is the, the name for these trees. And ooh, hopefully I don't fall off the car while I try to get this. Okay, so now there's two types of creatures that use a terminalia and they're, they're bugs. One is an ant and one is a wasp. And what they do is the ant will bite the tree. And I'm going to put it over there so Dave can show you nicely. Uh, the ant will bite the tree and the wasp will sting the tree. And that causes the tree to release a growth hormone. So it makes the tree think it needs to send as much food as possible to that little spot that's been stung or bitten by the wasp or ant. And what that does is create this big bulb on the, on the thing. And that also makes... Let's see, I'm going to open it up. Okay. Now if we have a look, now this is an old one. Can't really see. Whoopsie. Can you see in there? So inside there is a little hollow, and the ants and the all the wasps. This is an ant nest, not a wasp nest. And they lay their eggs inside there, and uh, that gives them a protective casing to protect themselves from other things except for the woodpecker. And that's what that woodpecker was doing. It was going from every single different terminalia tree that's got these ant and wasp nests in them and opening them up and eating the babies from inside. Interesting, huh? It's amazing how uh, nature has developed this to protect the baby ants and the baby wasps, but nature's also made sure that they don't get too many baby ants or baby wasps. And uh, hey, Brad! Hi, Sean. <laughs> That's Sean. He's a, he's a ranger uh, from the, <laughs> the reserve next to us and a friend of mine. He's a very happy guy, as you can hear. So as I was saying, so nature's made sure that these ants or wasps don't get too many and hurt the tree by having birds like the cardinal woodpecker that can open them up. So really, really interesting. We're going to keep moving, keep looking for elephants. Let's see. I've got so many wires on me. Hopefully I can. There we go. So I know about your school. So my cousins went to St. Benedict's. So I know about your school. So very, very, it's really awesome to have you guys on drive with us. Now apparently Jamie says I'm going to try to show you a picture of a pangolin. I'm going to try to find some shade to make it a little bit easier with the screen. Uh, go and let's go there's a bit of shade there okay so we gotta I'll try to get some shade on my dashboard and yeah, there's a spot that might work
How's that there? There you go. That's a pangolin or a scaly anteater. So there we go. Now it's one of the, it is an endangered species. Now they also eat bugs, they eat ants uh, and pangolins in this area. Can you believe that they don't very much like variety? They're like one species of ant. So 98% of what they eat is made up of one species of ant called a pugnacious ant. Now, pugnacious means it's a nasty ant. If you have to walk near them, they attack your feet and bite you. So that is a pangolin. Okay, let's keep moving while we keep searching for other creatures, uh, both big and small, out here in the African bush. Let's see how Jamie's doing. We are also searching for creatures big and small, but I hear that Brent has been showing you some leaves, and I'm going to show you leaves of a different kind. Now, this tree is called a weeping wattle, and it's a very, very useful tree for a very important purpose. Hold on one moment, I'm going to jump out and I'm going to explain to you why that is. So, if I jump out of the car and we go and grab some of these leaves, I'm going to bring them a little bit closer. I'm not going to take all of them, obviously, because some poor animal might want to come along and eat this tree. But I'll take a few so that I can show you what you do with them. Now, have a look at these leaves. Now, you can't feel them, obviously, but I can. And you can see, if I run my hand along it, very, very soft. There's no thorns on them. They're very soft leaves. They've got a fur that is very nice to feel. It's nice on the skin. Now, if you put them together like this, and then imagine you've got a whole lot of them sort of put together in this kind of way, you think maybe what you might need to use them for. So we can use them as human beings. Animals like to eat them, but not too much. They only really eat them when there's not much else to eat around here. But there is a very important use for people in the bush. Now, let's say you go out on a game drive and you forget to bring something very important. You forget to bring a toilet paper. Then that tree is also called the toilet paper tree because you can use it for that exact purpose. Biodegradable, it's all natural and you have to, if you find yourself in desperate times then that is what you can use for toilet paper but be careful if you do that because there are trees called acacia trees that have leaves that look the same but and sickle bush, actually, hold on, I'm going to show you. I don't even need to just explain it to you, I can show you because I can see some in front of us. So you've got to be careful what you pick to use as toilet paper because if we go here, look at this tree. Its leaves are exactly the same, but, and this is a very important but, this tree is called a sickle bush. And it's called a sickle bush because it has thorns. And you definitely don't want to use this particular tree as your toilet paper at all. Uh, just a little important reminder out here in the bush. If you wanted to use this tree for something useful, it has painkiller properties. So if you've got a headache, you can take the bark and soak it in water and you can drink that. And it will help to remove your headache. Oh, just some interesting facts on trees, because as Brent was telling you, it's not always about the big, hairy and scary animals. But we're going to look for some of those as well. Let's go see if we can't find an elephant somewhere here. And a very interesting question coming through from Ike, who would like to know how many types of different woodpeckers we get out here. And the answer is, Ike, we usually see four different types. One is called a bearded woodpecker, and they all look very, very similar, which means you've got to study your birds carefully to know the difference between the woodpeckers. One is called a bearded woodpecker because it's got a beard, a black patch of feathers that runs down its face. The other is called a cardinal because it kind of looks like it's wearing a cardinal's hat on the top of its head. The other is called a Bennett's woodpecker. I don't know why it's called a Bennett's woodpecker. Maybe somebody called Bennett's discovered it. And then you also get a woodpecker called a golden-tailed because its tail is more gold, golden-looking than all of the other woodpeckers. 
So those are the four main woodpecker species that we get out here. There's lots of different kinds throughout South Africa, but those four are the ones that really like this habitat. Come on, everybody, let's look for our animals. Where are they hiding on t today? Maybe they're all still feeling a bit cold, looking for some sun to warm themselves up in. Look for our elephants. Basani, you want to know, is there a way to tell male and female elephants apart? That's a very good question because it can be actually really difficult when you're looking at young elephants. So one of the biggest differences is the shape of the skin underneath their legs. So between their back legs, a male has got a V between their back legs, whereas a female sort of have flat skin underneath their legs. But if you don't see, because often elephants are in thick, thick vegetation, they're hiding away and you can only see their heads. One of the best ways is to look at the shape of the forehead. So the males, imagine I'm an elephant. I know it's difficult. Look, I've got tusks. Ha ha. I'm an elephant. Doesn't really work, does it? But pretend I'm an elephant and I'm, you're looking at me from the side. So a male elephant, his forehead goes, boom, it's round. It's a round forehead. But a female elephant, her forehead goes straight out, top of her head, and then down towards her nose. Makes an angle, like a sharp angle. Whereas the males, it's nice and round around the top of their heads. Also with their tusks, if the elephant has tusks, because they don't always, males tend to be thicker than the females. So they can be the same length, but the, fe the females are slightly narrower, slightly narrower tusks, usually only really about that thick. Whereas a male's can be absolutely enormous, can be this thick, can be this thick, can even be this thick. There are some elephants that had tusks that weigh more than I do. Now there's elephants recorded having tusks, one tusk, weighing 70 kilograms, 80 kilograms in the Kruger National Park. Huge animals. And only the male's tusks get that big. But you've got to be careful because just like human beings, some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us have brown hair, some of us have black hair. The elephants are kind of the same. Some elephants have long tusks, some have short tusks. It depends on their genetics. Aiden, you've asked me a question, which is, what is the scientific name of a giraffe? And I'm very impressed with your wanting to know that particular Latin name. And it's a really good thing because the Latin name tells you a little bit about the animal. So a, a giraffe's Latin name is a Camilla pardus giraffe. I don't quite know how you pronounce it, to be honest. But Camilla pardus, camel leopard. You can imagine the people, when they first saw, saw a giraffe, which must have been very, very strange, the people who first named a giraffe, because, of course, there would have been people that had seen the giraffe their whole lives, but the people that, who first named the giraffe, they kind of thought it was like a camel, and then pardus means leopard. That's the name for a leopard, like a panther. So a camel leopard, camel leopard giraffe. That's what the Latin name is for a giraffe. Isn't that weird? Camillo pardus, but it makes sense because giraffe walk like camels with one foot on both feet on one side, then both feet on the other side. There's not really any other animals out here that do that. So you can see, and it's got spots. So like a leopard, it's got spots. And that's why the giraffe has the name Camillo pardus. Very impressive question though. It's good to be interested in the Latin names because they tell you something about the animal itself. Like if you talk about the Latin name of a lion, it's Panthera leo. The leopard's name is a Panthera, a Panthera pardus. So that tells you immediately, leopards and lions come from the same genus. They're closely, closely related to each other. That's why Latin names are important out here. Right, let us find you something very cool to look at. And a really lovely question coming through from Yanni. Because pangolin looks so, they kind of look like dinosaurs, don't they? Or like a weird reptile. And Yanni wants to know, do they give birth or do they lay eggs? 
they do in fact give birth and the amazing thing is after the mommy pangolin has given birth the baby climbs up onto her back and hangs on it has a piggyback for the first few months of its life that's how she carries it around because its tiny little legs can't keep up with mom so she carries it on her back I can see what you're thinking but it's only in terms of because a pangolin is a mammal it's not a reptile or anything like this the only mammals in the world that lay eggs are in the sort of Australia region, the Australasia region of the world. So we don't have any mammal species here in South Africa that lay eggs. Only the birds and the reptiles here that will lay an egg in order to produce a baby. Here we're coming to my favorite tree and one day I'm going to come through here and there's going to be a leopard sitting in the top of the tree. But not today, I don't think. I don't see any leopards. Do you see any leopards, Jandre? Do any of you see any leopards? I don't, unfortunately. But this is the perfect place for a leopard to climb up into the tree, be nice and safe and hide away there. And we have a lovely question from Ike, which is, do wasps sting lions? And the answer is yes, sometimes they do. If the lion isn't being very careful, if it sticks its nose where it doesn't belong, then a wasp might sting a lion. And of course they can just fly away, so they don't even need to be scared of the lion if the lion gets cross that it's been stung on the nose. Where are all of the animals hiding this morning? Oh, while we go and look for some elephants, Matthew wants to know how do elephants clean their babies? And the answer is, Matthew, they don't really. They don't really bother too much about keeping their babies squeaky clean. However, what they do do is they take their babies to water and sometimes the baby elephants go climbing into the water and then they watch what their mothers do. So maybe even maybe their mothers teach them how to do this. We don't know because we don't speak elephant. We speak a little bit of elephant, but we don't speak their whole language fluently. So maybe mom teaches them to take mud in their trunk and to splash it on them. Now that sounds like getting dirty, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like washing. But in fact, for an elephant baby, that's exactly what it does. First of all, it works as a sunblock, so it keeps their sensitive baby skin safe from the hot African sun, as we should all do. We should all take a lesson from elephants and wear sunblock each and every day, whenever we are out here, because the sun is very, very strong, even on the cold winter's mornings. And so the elephant does that. It also keeps things like insects, ticks, and other animals parasites, mites, all their tiny little microscopic creepy crawlies from being able to get into the elephant's skin and making it itchy and uncomfortable. So that's another reason why baby elephants, the mothers don't worry too much about them being covered in mud because it's kind of their way of keeping clean and protected. Now, uh, this morning, the animals are playing hide-and-seek with us, and that's because it's not like a zoo out here. Now, we've got to go and find the animals, and sometimes they are very, very difficult to find. Now, it was really very, very cold when we started off our morning safari as the sun started to come up, and that's why all of the animals are hiding away. They're hiding behind bushes. They're trying to keep themselves warm. Now, we are trying to find them for you, but they are playing hide and seek and we need all of you to help us try and search for them. So some days there's lots of animals, other days they're hiding away. And also because there's been a little bit of rain, we had rain yesterday and the night before, that's really good because there's a massive drought here at the moment, there's not enough water for the animals to drink, but because there was rain, 
It also means that the animals don't have to walk all the way to the water holes to drink because there's lots of puddles in the middle of the bushes. So they don't have to stress themselves out and go further than they need to. They are walking around finding water in here. Here's an animal, but you can see how it's playing hide and seek with us. If I stop, hopefully he will... Oh, we're talking about different animals. Awesome! These are my favorite animals. <laughs> Look at that. Now that it's getting a bit warmer, the dwarf mongoose are coming out. Hold on a second. We're going to go forward a bit because these animals are really comfortable with us in the vehicle. So they might dash into their holes for a moment, but they will come back out. Yay! I'm so glad we could show these animals to you. These are my favorite, and they're so curious. They're all going into their holes now because we're coming past, but we're going to switch off and we're going to watch them pop their heads back out of the termite mound. This is the smallest carnivore that we get out here. So, Zachary, we might not get panthers, um, unfortunately. Now, panther is just a name for a black leopard, Zachary, before we talk about these dwarf mongoose. A panther is a name for a black leopard or a melanistic leopard, so we might get one out here. I've never seen one in this area, unfortunately, but they do exist in South Africa, and all it is is a leopard that has a genetic mutation that makes them black rather than their normal gold and spotted color. Right, let's talk about these little guys. Said that they're the smallest mammal predator in the Sabi sands. They're very, very tiny. They're kind of like the size of a large rat, but they're not rats. It's an animal called a mongoose, and they have very, very complex little families that they live in. See how they're looking at me? whenever I make that noise, and speaking mongoose to them, making little contact calls and squeaks. Now they've just, just got warm enough to start going out and digging under the leaves for insects. Now these are fierce scorpion hunters. They've even been known to kill big snakes before, working together as a team. I love them because they're really clever, they're really curious, and they're also very, very cute. They live in a family that has kind of like a mom and a dad. So it's an alpha female and alpha male. And only the alpha female and male will make the babies of the group. The rest of the group helps to babysit them, to feed them, to look after them. They're amazing. And what they do is they live in these old termite mounds that are full of holes that they can dash into, like the one that's behind this mongoose that you're looking, up, looking at now. So they've got a jungle gym and a home, all rolled into one. And the more you sit with the dwarf mongoose, the more you see. I'm just trying to do a little bit of a count here, a head count. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 little dwarf mongoose all running around. Can't see them all but we can see those of them that are scurrying about the entrance to their home. Now this is where they've spent the night, tucked away safely. Look carefully, because you've got to keep a sharp eye to spot a dwarf mongoose. This is where they, they went to sleep last night, cuddled up inside their tunnels, inside a termite mound, nice and warm, keep themselves cozy. And only when it gets light, and in winter, dwarf mongoose are kind of lazy. They like to sleep in every morning because it's too cold for them to go out. And they only come out when the sun comes up and they can go and lie in the sun and get warm again. Oh, hear that little alarm call? There's a squeak and then everybody ran to see if they could go somewhere safely. Hey guys, just keep an eye on the dwarf mongoose for a moment. And let us see if we sit here nice and quietly, they will get curious. Because Declan, 
absolutely I have sat before quite quiet just sitting patiently and I have had dwarf mongoose come right up to my vehicle even sniff my tires and try and chew on them so these little animals do get brave and they do come running up to the vehicle if you sit here for long enough that's why I love them because they're curious they want to explore their world and find out what's happening around them they're also really peaceful animals so when the time comes to look for a new head of the family so the new dominant male or dominant female instead of fighting like the lions and the impala that we were talking about earlier these little guys have a competition and can you guess what they compete in I bet you can't because I never would have believed it if I didn't know that it was true they have a competition to see which ones can clean each other for the longest so they groom each other cleaning with their teeth and their tongue licking the fur until one of them just can't keep the other clean anymore and lies down exhausted and then the one that kept cleaning is the winner and becomes the new head of the family the new alpha of the family how fascinating is that really really fantastic that they have that method of solving their problems rather than fighting about it Uh, unfortunately the boys at St. Benedict's have to leave us uh, I'm sorry that we have to see you go because there's so many amazing things to see out here unfortunately I'm going to sneeze <laughs> okay it's gone sorry that sneeze was about to okay it's gone I, I swallowed it <laughs> unfortunately the boys at St. Benedict's have to go so we're going to say a big goodbye and a big thank you for joining us on behalf of Brent, myself, Jandre and Dave we hope you enjoy the rest of your school day and we hope to see you on the back of our vehicle once again bye bye everybody and for the rest of our viewers sticking with us thank you very much just an update they found the Nkuhumas on Arethusa there is a queue that is longer than two of my arms to get to them so we will have to wait we'll probably only see them this afternoon on the sunset safari and while we continue on looking for wonderful things to find you I am going to send you back across to Brent to find out what he's been occupying his morning with thanks uh, everyone for your patience with the school drives it is incredibly important to breed the next generation of conservationists. So uh, we do appreciate your patience while we deal with the future uh, of wildlife in the world. And I've just decided to come for a little bumble down Hyena Road, a road we don't drive too often, uh, just to see if there's anything about. Sometimes male leopards seem to pop out in this area. So, so I heard, unfortunately, the Nkumas did cross into Arethusa, so sunset safari you definitely go have a look for them there and i think this sunset i might head down to cheetah plains i keep planning to get there but never quite make it because we keep finding such spectacular stuff here on juma and it is a beautiful winter's day warming up quite quickly and we're quite happy about that it was bitterly cold this morning Ooh, six or seven degrees celsius and uh, yes, no, I, and I, I'm not a big fan of being cold. And the only time I, I don't mind being cold is if when I'm in search of Africa's wildlife. But unfortunately, very, very quiet on the general game front this morning. And that's due to the rain. The elephants uh, and things like zebra and wildebeest will quite often spread out once there has been a bit of rain and they'll take advantage of all the puddles uh, and little pans that have a bit of water in it uh, and they might be a bit closer to good grazing at the moment. Oh, a big welcome to Kevin, who's a, a new viewer. Uh, welcome. And Kevin's wondering, how much rain have we received due to these storms? 
Not enough is the, the answer, Kevin. Um, uh, in total, just under 15 millimeters, uh, which is very good for this time of the year, but we are, have been experiencing a massive drought. Ooh, let's hope I don't get stuck in a deep puddle. David, are we gonna get stuck? Ooh, it's quite muddy. Should be okay. Whoa, splash, just splash. But so, Kevin, uh, we've been going through a very big drought. It's the, uh, the biggest drought in South Africa since 1992. And uh, every little bit of rain helps. So this little middle winter, which is, uh, we do, everyone says it doesn't rain during winter. It does, but normally about once and normally about the sort of 15 to 20 mil mark. Uh, it happens almost every year, even though people seem to get surprised every year when it rains in the middle of winter. Uh, but uh, normally our rainy season is from November. Uh, through to April and our average rainfall over the rainy season is normally about 400 mils, 450 sometimes and uh, this year we had 120 so far far less than normal. Well, even the birds are evading me this morning. Jamie's had all the luck, lions, wild dogs We've had, what, what have we had? Kudu, chin spot batis, battalier, cardinal woodpecker. Is that all we've seen today, Dave? <laughs> oh, it's been a bit quiet, but it's nevertheless been beautiful and fun being out here. I'm very lucky that I absolutely love what I do. And whether I'm looking at big cats or little bugs, I still get excited. I was really hoping for some e elephants, but I have literally covered the majority of Juma this morning and not even a sign. So they might have spread out, headed north and south. One thing I have been keeping a close eye out for, for due to this little bit of rain, we might get one or two little wildflowers in the next day that might spring up. And I really do enjoy my wildflowers. Uh, Pierre's wondering whether to do anything for the flora in the park or just for the fauna. Uh, with the drought, there are a few pumped water holes for the, uh, the fauna. But uh, that's about it. We, do, we try to do very little for flora or fauna. Um, if there are any exotic flora species, they are removed. Uh, but a drought is part of the natural cycle out here in the African bush. It, help keep, it helps keep animal populations under control. It also helps to change the flora. So in a drought like this, the elephants are really focused on feeding on the trees and that'll give the grass species a good chance to recover uh, and come up after the next set of good rains. But, and, and it all depends on the year. So it is a system that is in balance. Uh, if we had to start fiddling with it, we might start causing problems. I think the best, the best sort of description I've had is that human beings are, are gardeners in Eden. We go take an absolutely perfect system that's working immaculately well and we decide we can make it better. And quite often when we do do that, all we do is make it worse. And uh, so it's best to leave nature to sort nature's problems out. And an area like this, of course, uh, in certain areas, if it's fenced completely and not an open system like we're in, you do need to do some management uh, of flora and fauna. Oh, an animal death! Thank goodness, yes. <laughs> Not normally we rush off like this after an Inyala, but we have not seen much today. And looks like a nice male Inyala. And it looks like he's practicing a bit of phylo erection, which means there could be another male Inyala that he's having a standoff with. Let's go see. Oh, there's some girls there to impress. Yes, there we go. Oh, this is awesome. Look at that. 
Now, this is an Inyala bull fight. Now, when you see their manes raised like that, and those stiff legs, uh, it means they are competing for those females that are next to them. There could be a female who's coming into estrus. Inyala's breed throughout the year. Now, this is a very, very interesting adaption by Inyala. Now, what it is, is to stop having to physically actually attack each other. They try and have a who's prettier competition, and the most impressive uh, generally wins. They will actually lock horns from time to time, but this little display of the stiff legs and raised mane is to try avoid physical contact. Now, at the moment, it's difficult to say who's the winner. Now, oh, they're not, it seems like he's putting his mane down a bit, but you can see he's sniffing at the females. So one of them is probably about to come into estrus. And the winner, or the Inyala that is winning when we first arrived is that one we've got in shot at the moment. And the reason I say this is the, the, the Inyala that's winning puts his tail up. So you can see his tail raised. I'm just trying to see if we can get another view of them. So here we go. So that the bigger male is escorting the smaller male away from the females. There's the smaller male now on the right. Unfortunately, they're on a little bit of thick bush. But just judging from how serious the standoff was, uh, I would say that that female, if she is, she's not probably not in estrus yet and might only be coming into estrus in a little while. So there's enough pheromones or hormones in the air to excite the males, but not enough to put them into a full-blown standoff or even possibly a fight. So look at this, there we go. See the, the male on the left, just making sure the youngster uh, keeps his distance a little bit. But this isn't too serious a standoff. But the one on the left is definitely winning. Oh, they are incredibly exquisite antelope. I really like their orange socks. On the males. So they're one of the only antelope that shows great sexual dimorphism uh, between male and female. The females are that lovely orange color and the males the dark chocolate brown. And you probably find that has evolved due to the fact of their standoff way of fighting. So they need to look more impressive so they've evolved a darker coloration than the females. Uh, but they've kept their orange socks. It's been great having you guys on the safari with us. We are coming to the end of the Sunrise Safari. And again, we thank you for your patience with the school drives. It is really important to get the next bunch of conservationists prepped and ready to take over the torch uh, from the rest of us. Now, and great to have a bunch of new viewers with us this morning. Uh, hopefully you'll be joining us in a few short hours for the sunset safari and hopefully we're going to have uh, hopefully we can go find those in Kahuma Lions and Arethusa I think I might head towards Cheetah Plains just because I haven't been there in a while and just see what's happening uh, there we go, bye bye Nyalas as they're going to head along feeding we're going to leave you with vigils of the Nyalas as I said don't forget to join us for the Sunset Safari in a few short hours.